All right, so hi again, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the student presentations and the product gallery. We're really proud of all the work that the students did this semester and really grateful to all of our project partners who so generously lent their time to us and the students this semester. So thank you very much. I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, implementing a framework for using a law school class as a lab for innovation and then a little bit about what we learned and how that informs what we aim to do for the rest of this conference. And I would just keep in mind that uh, that we did the, use this framework for a law school class, but it could serve as a great structure for any organization wanting to implement an innovation lab or project. Okay, so first, why do a lab like this? Well, because it adds value. So value for the students, so they get to break uh, away from these law school hypotheticals and work on problems that are real and current. Value for the project partners, so they do get a bit of unpaid help <laughs> to solve a problem currently plaguing their organization, but I think as we heard earlier, they learn a lot of, of things from doing these projects and working with these students as well. And then value for the industry, so by breaking out of these law firm, legal aid, law school silos and openly sharing our experiences, we're contributing to the collective knowledge and creativity of the industry and it's our hope that this will inspire others to do the same and that we'll continue to see real movement in the improvement of delivery of legal services and access to justice. So now that you have decided that running an innovation lab is a great idea, where should you start? Well, I would recommend starting with a strong vision. And not all labs will have the same vision. It's important to find your North Star, what's most important to you, and let that guide you through the decision-making process where you have to answer questions such as, uh, what teachings are within the scope of the class? With whom should we work? What type of technology should we use? And should we require the use of technology at all? And, and so, like I think Dan's probably mentioned before, we very much envisioned this litigation class as a capstone course that would draw in all the other disciplines that we teach in our other legal R&D courses. And we wanted to simulate the real world as much as possible. So we wanted to give the students the tools and have them make the decision. So they have to figure out which technology is right for their problem. They have to grapple with project management, reporting up, and managing their group dynamics. Okay, so now you have your purpose. Your next step is to define your lab structure, roles, and responsibilities. And so the nature of innovation efforts, product development, startup culture requires an agile mindset. There'll be plenty of scope changes and unexpected circumstances that arise that make it imperative to have as much clearly defined upfront as you can. And so this starts with defining the roles and responsibilities for everyone involved. And so here's how we chose to define the, the roles for our class. So first you have uh, the instructors. These are what, are what I call the owners. So they're ultimately responsible for the success of the class and the projects. They're responsible for managing expectations, preventing complete failures, ensuring student teams follow best practices, and then just acting as a coach to facilitate communication and generation of new ideas. And then we have our project partners, and these are what I call the sponsors. So they're the clients. They're responsible for setting the challenge after receiving clear direction from the instructors, the owners, and then engaging with the, students te the student teams to help them really understand how their current process works and what the problem is. And then of course we have our students, and these are our student innovation teams. And their job is to deliver a final product to the owners and the sponsors, and then to actively engage in the class material so that they can understand when the disciplines taught can be employed to deliver the best possible product. Next you would want to think about what deliverables you're after. And if your deliverables are clear and important to you, if they're part of your vision, there's no reason why you shouldn't decide on these before thinking about your roles and responsibilities. The point is that you make the decision on these two things early on and let that guide you through the rest of your framework. So you'd want to think about what should be the final product that the students, for example, deliver at the end of the semester. Is it a built app? Is it a paper proposing an innovation, a case study? Whatever it is, if your goal is to incorporate technology, there are additional things that you'd want to think about, like whether you have the budget to be able to work with a vendor, or if you could get an educational license or a sandbox environment, for example. And then you'd want to get a good idea of what all is out there and which uh, tool fits best with the problem you're trying to solve. So I've done my best to sort of categorize some of these different tools. So you've got expert systems, workflow automation platforms, AI-assisted review tools, other document automation tools and data visualization software. 
And there's some argument that most of these tools do many of these things, but you would just want to think about what each tool does best and uh, which one fits with your vision. Also keep in mind the time frame of your class, as some of these tools are relatively simple and easy to learn, and others have quite a learning curve. So for example, Q&A markup is a pretty slick and easy to use tool, while Neotologic is really powerful and therefore requires a little bit more time to get trained on. And this is certainly not a compre comprehensive list of tools, and these time frames are sort of my best estimate based on students with a full course load and no coding experience. The point is, time is an important factor con to consider when you're thinking about employing technology in a class setting or any, under any other time constraints. But there are other ways to innovate without technology. So innovation is all about making the practice of law better, easier and more efficient for lawyers, more accessible to clients, delivering higher value and better quality. And so sometimes the best solution doesn't require a technology tool at all. Other potential deliverables could be a process improvement project, so creating detailed process maps to understand and improve a current process. Uh, data solutions, so identifying key performance indicators, setting up a data infrastructure, or any other data analysis and visualization project. And then any other practical output from synthesizing, organizing, and managing information, so like comprehensive checklists or flowcharts of the law. What foundational principles or disciplines are needed to be successful? Well, we first wanted to encourage our students to embrace certain mindsets. And the first of these was no solution jumping. So really think about and understand the problem you're trying to solve and be strategic and scientific in your brainstorming. And, and here, this, ideally, the students would have been able to go and see how the work was actually done. But since we worked almost completely remotely, the students had to work even more closely with their project partners to understand how the current process worked. The second mentality is this idea of failing fast or learning fast in rapid prototyping. And the idea here is to create a series of minimum viable products rather than a whole solution at once that may not be what your client actually wants, and then reiterate and build off of the prototypes. And then finally, user-centered design. So this idea of designing your end product with the end user in mind. You don't, don't just guess what your client wants, ask them what they want. We also wanted them to be comfortable with agile project management principles, which we felt would allow for more flexibility than a traditional waterfall method, uh, and then process improvement. So we drew in process improvement tools such as process mapping and root cause analysis using the improvement kata as a framework to understand the current condition, identify and overcome obstacles, and design the desired future state. So that's the what, but how did we instill these disciplines? We trained the students through a mix of in-class work and substantive hands-on workshops. So over the course of the semester, we hosted a fantastic series of workshops, including a project management and process improvement workshop, a design thinking workshop, a computational law workshop, there's Jeff, and a startups and entrepreneurship mini boot camp for lawyers. And then they also worked with project management tools. So as a requirement for the class, they, the students had to produce project management staples such as a project charter and communication plan. But we also wanted the students to be very comfortable with agile project management principles. So we highly encouraged our student teams to run scrum meetings and sprint planning sessions where they would prioritize and allocate their work, improve their team communication, and make their team meetings more productive. Uh, but we also did periodic in-class sprint planning sessions where we asked them what they completed in the last week, what needed to get done within the next week, and then they would allocate those tasks among their team members, and then had them list any obstacles that were standing in their way. We used the Improvement Kata as a solution development roadmap that we wanted each team to follow. And I'm going to spend a bit of time going through this mode roadmap because it served as a great framework for the class and allowed us to draw in all of these core disciplines and provided a good mix of freedom and constraints. So the roadmap was as follows. First, clearly articulate the overall challenge. So this is what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to measure your success, so what your key metrics are. And then the students worked to deeply understand the problem and the current state. And they did this by mapping the current process, flowcharting the law, identifying key metrics and assessing any available data, identifying current users and stakeholders in the process, and then asking about any past efforts. So what has the organization already tried and what were the results? And then they identified obstacles to reaching their overall challenge. 
And then they set a first target condition. So the target condition is an incremental step toward reaching your overall challenge. And it should be both reasonable and a business imperative, so in imperative to reaching the challenge. And then it should help you overcome one of the obstacles that you've identified. And then they conducted a f an experiment. So after some team brainstorming, they narrowed it down to one thing that they wanted to try first. And then they conducted a plan, do, check, act cycle where they ran the experiment, got feedback from their project partners, reiterated, and built off of that. And then they cycled back, before, back and forth between numbers four and five until the delivery of a final product. And just a couple of more notes on this. Uh, some latitude should be given regarding what each team wants to try and when. Uh, however, each team should have as one of their target conditions a comprehensive flowchart of the law and a functional spec sheet for how the app will actually function. And there will likely be multiple iterations of these documents as the teams get feedback from their project partners, but these documents will serve as a good anchor for their projects. And then each, uh, during each target condition, after each target condition, they should get uh, feedback and they should do user testing. So get feedback from various sources such as their project partners, their classmates, instructors, and so forth. And so just some things to think about if you are thinking about working with outside partners. Can you repeat target condition? Um, can I do that when I'm done? Sure. Okay. So, um, so just some things to think about if you're thinking, of, if you're thinking about working with outside partners. I would suggest using a targeted approach. So what did you identify as your vision and how would working with X partner help you achieve that vision? And then even though any organization willing to consider becoming a project partner is likely already amenable to the idea, you'd still want to make sure that you're communicating the unique value proposition of being involved. And then it's also important to manage expectations up front. So expectations around feasibility. So it has to be able to be done within the span of one semester, for example. Expectations around sharing. So will it be open source or what will happen with the final product? And then expectations around communication and feedback. So how often will you check in and what's the protocol for feedback? So often we tend to think that we've done something useful just because we're doing something. But a major theme we tried to instill in our students this semester was that you can't know that you're improving a process unless you have concrete metrics for comparison. So for example, let's say that you want to assess whether a solution you're implementing is actually creating value. Some metrics that I challenged our students to think about this semester were uh, how long does the process currently take and what's the time savings after the solution implementation? How many times does the document currently get sent back for revision and then what's the new bounce back rate? And how many steps are in the current process and how many steps were you able to identify as waste and therefore eliminate? And through this process we learned that legal organizations typically haven't collected data in this way so it's a little bit hard for the students to know what an improvement would be and this isn't the fault of the firm or the organization it's just that they typically haven't been incentivized to quantify or measure their processes. And my hypothesis is that many legal organizations are not collecting data in this way because it is such a huge job and they may just not know where to begin. So that's what we hope to do today. By setting this empirical research agenda, we can take that first step toward meaningfully measuring the, the, uh, meaningfully measuring the performance and quality of those delivering legal services and education. And I'm excited to get started. So thank you.